Once you get into a historical type thing, I like it to stay accurate to the historical stuff. Yeah. If not, if not, it, I don't want to see it. I'd rather, I'd rather watch a complete, a completely imaginary story, you know, where, you know, the land doesn't, you know, like Lord of the Rings, you know, that doesn't even exist. That kind of thing. Other than, ha- other than <laughs> trying to take a historical story and, and messing it up. That's why I was very shocked that, I mean, I really was shocked that HBO, which tends to, like most of these networks, tends to be liberal. Uh, I was surprised that they were faithful to uh, to the John Adams thing. That was that was pretty. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. It was another good uh, movie. I mean, good series in HBO was uh, what happened in Chernobyl. Very accurate. Oh yeah. I'm oh. surprised. Oh yeah, excellent. What happened in Chernobyl? I mean, you know the um, the, the atomic thing. I mean the. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it was very well done. Especially okay, the last chapter, yeah, like a seven, where, seven chapters, I think it was. That's where you have an advantage over me. <laughs> I'm not like a historical buff, so uh, you know I have to watch it carefully. But once I see a little idiosyncrasy of something that's not real, I'm like, ah, no, I'm sorry, this is. And you know the, uh, you know the way they built nuclear power plants in Russia was nothing like they do in America. In America, they have like a, a containment building. So what happened in Chernobyl could never happen in America, okay? But it was the thing that uh, Mario Cuomo, when he was governor, used to eliminate all the power plants in Long Island. He said, I don't want you know, the government in Chernobyl. You cannot compare that thing. It's impossible. But people believe it. People believe and, it. And when you're talking to a very uneducated society, sure. you can... And the, the nuclear around. power plants don't have plutonium, so it cannot go boom. Yeah, you know, it cannot explode. Again, people people are ignorant. They don't they don't do. Yeah, research. yeah. They, they, Again, they, they, we have more available knowledge than anybody in the history of the world, mm-hmm. and yet I guarantee you, we're more ignorant than most people. Like I remember when Ed Hirsch wrote that book um, about uh, American education and how people couldn't even they couldn't even just, they couldn't even tell you if Abraham Lincoln came before John F. Kennedy. I mean, they just didn't, they, they had a, what was it? I think it was called Illiterate America or something like that. And he wrote a fantastic little book on, on it. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's just out there. <clears throat> you know, Jay Leno, he was the, uh, the entertainer. The, uh, he was in late, late night TV. Sometimes uh-huh. he used to go to universities and ask questions about geography to the kids. Uh-huh. So he went to this university and he asked a question, what is the largest country in South America? And people say, uh, uh, Africa? Wow. Yeah, I heard that. Wow. I said, no, no, it's Brazil. Oh, 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 they didn't know the basic stuff. Wow. Africa. Africa. I mean, that, I mean, you're yeah, not even, you know, it's a continent. Not even on the right continent. I mean, it's just, I mean, South America. It's not a country, it's think, a continent. We think already Spanish. We think all the Hispanic, all the Hispanic places, you know, Hispania. But it's like, man, you, you're not even, you're not even here. You're like, geography wise, you're over there. And yet you Incredible. see all these kids. That means that's why their education is lousy. They're not being taught anything. Yeah. They're only being yeah. taught, you know, what gender are you and you know, uh, <laughs> you know what's your favorite chain? You know, now with the well, now with Biden, we'll find out what your favorite ice cream is. You know, maybe that, that'll become an important question. Well, let, let's yeah. get started. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we could be here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your many mercies, for your kindness. We ask, Lord, that as we uh, begin to study, that you guide us. Uh, just uh, bless us, Lord. Guide our conversation that everything be for your glory. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today, I want to get started. Uh, just We're not going to go into actual scripture. We're just going to do the background to okay. the Philippians. So uh, <clears throat> this will just be intro. And you can just jump in if you have any questions. But first, okay. I, want to, I want to deal with the actual city of Philippi. Um, the ancient Macedonian city of Philippi is uh, today known by its Greek name, Kernides, K-R-E-N-I-D-E-S, which is in the northeast uh, of modern Greece. The town was settled in the 4th century BC by Philip II of Macedon, who is the father of Alexander the Great, and he, and, and he renamed it Philippi in his own honor. The city remained important even after the Roman conquest of Macedonia in 168-167 BC. However, in 42 BC, the plains of Philippi were the site of one of the most famous and important battles in Roman history, when Mark Anthony and Octavian uh, Augustus defeated the Republican forces of Brutus and Cassius, who were the people who were uh, 
were part of those who assassinated Julius Caesar. Uh, the victors settled many of their veterans in Philippi, reestablishing the city's, a city as a Roman colony. Uh, more Roman veterans settled in, in the city again after Octavian had another famous battle with, uh, had, a, had a battle with uh, Mark Anthony at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Uh, thereafter, Octavian, Augustus, renamed the colony after himself, calling it Colonia Julia Augusta Philippinus, uh, Philippinus, whatever. In, in Paul's time, Philippi had a, had a population of about 10,000, about one-tenth the size of Thessalonica. Uh, Phil Philippi was a classic Romanized Greek city, complete with a Roman system, system of government. The colonists enjoyed Italian legal st status and certain tax exemptions because obviously their association with, uh, with Rome and being many of, the, many of the veterans retired there, they, they had many privileges. And also it became like a little Rome because of, because of how many Romans were there that were soldiers. Um, most of the first century inscriptions that have been found are Latin, not Greek. Uh, a cohort of, of Praetorians, troops from the emperor's own personal guard, were garrisoned in Philippi. Uh, again, showing just the great association between Rome and Philippi, because the Praetorians really were those who protected the Roman emperor and those who were in Rome. And yet here they are in Philippi as well, showing that just the correlation between the two places. The, ru the ruling class were Latin in language, culturally Italian, and polit politically Roman. However, the outlining areas and most local laborers were Macedonian or Thracian, with immigrants coming from as far, uh, far away as Egypt, Asia Minor, and Judah, Judea. Uh, Greek language and cor culture, of course, never disappeared, uh, and it recovered its, its ascendancy in the third century uh, AD. So obviously, Greek, uh, Alexander the Great did conquer the world, and certainly Greek uh, state notoriously important, even in, even in Rome. Uh, so, but Latin, Latin was the main language of, uh, of Philippi, uh, at least uh, certainly among, among the cultural elite. Uh, uh, Greek, hmm. as in many places, was the, uh, the Koine Greek, common Greek, where people communicated that way. Uh, the resident religions reflect the diversity of the city. There were as many as 35 different gods that were venerated in Philippi. Prominent among them were the Trajan horsemen, Dionysus, uh, Artemis, Diana, uh, Silvanus, and not least, of course, the, the burgeoning uh, Roman Empire worship of the emperor, which here was more notorious than Rome. In Rome, they were cautious how they worshiped the emperor. Because you know that you still wanted to have this this imagery of the republic, and Rome still being you know uh, not just the emperor but the government. But in other places away from Rome, like Philippi, which is like a little Rome, there it was very much the worship of the emperor, and it wasn't just the emperor; it was the emperor and his whole family. So it'd be him, his wife Julia, um, mm. or what was his uh, was it Gaius? Uh, I can't remember his, uh, his adopted son. He had an adopted son, and he was also worshipped. And, of course, there was temple, of course, to Julius Caesar, his uncle. Um, and, of course, this is how he got himself into the title of God, because Julius Caesar was declared a god. And so then by adoption, because uh, Augustus was adopted by Julius Caesar, he was a son of a god. And so he can claim that. Any questions? Yeah, I understand that the, uh, uh, Alexander the Great was the one who founded the city in the name of his father. Oh, oh, from, from what, I, what I found, it was Philip himself who conquered the city and named it after himself. No, it was, I, I understand from what I'm reading here, it was Alexander the Great mm -hmm. that founded the city, and the city was honored with the names, I mean, in the name of his father. Oh. Originally, after Philip, the, you know, and uh, also, the uh, I'm looking at the uh, city here in okay. the Bible, the, the picture of the city. Uh -huh. And uh, you have the Acropolis, you got the Ignatian Way, the uh, theater, Neapolis, the bath, Angora, yeah. pretty good. And, uh, you know, people that, soldiers that retire, 
that will go to these colonies and they have very, very good lives mm -hmm. because they, they had full citizenship rights. Yeah. And uh, sometimes when you are away from Rome, you become more Romans than the, than the same Roman. The same exactly. thing happened in uh, the Falkland Islands. The British people living there became more British than the same British because they have a, an agenda to peddle there, you know? They put the, the flags there and uh, they wanted to make sure that they are British, yeah. you know, not Argentinians. Now, like I, don't know, I don't know the pictures you're seeing, but because um, of course Philippi has not been fully excavated because it's actually, there's still, there's, it's a modern city there still. So you can't really, unless you throw everybody out <laughs> and excavate it, you can't really excavate Is it. Um, Philippi in the time of Paul. Uh-huh. Yeah, but you can't, they couldn't really uh, excavate the whole thing because it's still, it's still a modern city. Although you have buildings okay. still around, uh, but they have found that there's a temple on the east side and then a temple on the west. And both of those temples were to the emperor. So again, something okay. that you could not get away with in Rome, you can get away with in Philippi, like I said, be more Roman than the Romans and, and have this sense of worship. But it, um, the, the, the reason they put the veterans there really was, um, was tactical because, you know, when you had all these soldiers coming back from war, the last thing you wanted was hungry, starving, angry yeah. soldiers. Or rebellion, yeah. You don't want them in Rome. So you found a place yeah. for them so you, they could be a, a certain distance from Rome and yet, you know, still have their own power and their own land. And sure. of course, you're giving them property, you're giving them tax exemption, all these things. But there was it was on purpose to keep them out of Rome. And so you find a place for them to retire so they don't end up being a, a yeah. burden. Uh, very smart. Yeah, of course. It was, it was tactical, very smart. Um, but I have to look up that Alexander thing. Uh, but again, the, the worship of the emperor became a, a very, a very big thing at that time. And and we're going to deal more with that here in uh, when we deal with Philippians, because in Philippians uh, we will see language that challenges the emperor. Uh, that he, uh, Paul uses titles and things that refer to uh, to the emperor, and he uses it for Christ. And so he, here he challenges in a very uh, subversive way, because again, you can't really, uh, if you challenge the emperor openly, you're in trouble. But most of the time when the emperor worship was challenged, it was more like incognito, like, you know, some sort mm -hmm. of parody, some sort of way of, of bringing, you know, um, like today, you know, you might have a way of mocking the system without saying I'm mocking the system. And the same thing happened in the ancient world, especially because, you know, you have the Roman Empire. It's not like they're going to be, uh, um, they're going to be warm and fuzzy uh, about these things. If they see you speaking out blatantly against the emperor or challenging that there's any God greater than him. Of course, they're going to squash you, especially like, uh, you know, the, the Christians. Um, but you, there are subversive ways in which every society where people have been oppressed uh, they have a way of challenging the system without saying we're challenging the system. And we're going to see that when we get to certain uh, sections of, uh, of Philippians. Any questions? Uh, no. Okay. The Philippian no. church, of course, had the distinction of being the first church in what we call Europe. Uh, and the first phase of Paul's mission in Macedonia, that is northern Greece. It marks Paul's move away from the cities with a sizable Jewish population, like those in Asia Minor, to cities that were essentially Gentile and pagan in both religion and culture. Not many Jews in, um, in, in Philippi. And we're going to get to that in a second when we, when we talk about uh, Lydia, where, where the mission begins. Uh, this is where Paul saw a whole new beginning of the gospel. Uh, sometime in 49, 50 AD, Paul and his co-workers, including uh, Silas, and perhaps Luke left Troas in Asia Minor and arrived at the port town of Neapolis, then taking a 12-mile walk to Philippi. Luke reports several events from Paul's initial visit. Uh, these include, of course, the conversion of Lydia, a Gentile god worshiper, uh, the exorcism of a, of a fortune-telling uh, slave girl, which is, of course, how Paul got into a lot of trouble in Philippi by uh, getting rid of the, you know, he... he, he <clears throat> He cast out a demon from that young girl who's saying these these are the servants of the Most High. Right. And, uh, he ended up getting in trouble because that was their that was their bread and butter. They were making money from this girl. 
Uh, and this plunged Paul and Silas into, into a great deal of trouble with the, with the business owners because he, he ruined their livelihood. Um, Paul and Silas were, of course, beaten and imprisoned without a trial. Uh, there was an earthquake at midnight. The region, of course, was uh, prone to earthquakes. And earthquakes, of course, just like, uh, you know, like some people might still treat them today, but in the ancient world, earthquakes were seen as like uh, the anger of the gods. I mean, a god must be angry. At the, so it was very, very important. Uh, this is the way they interpret these things. The jailer, of course, uh, fearing when, this, when the earthquake occurs and all the, all the prisoners can escape, he was going to kill himself because, of course, he would be held accountable for those people getting away. So, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the, fact that, the fact that Paul says, don't kill yourself, we're all here. Uh, but obviously, he must have been listening to Paul because Paul was there praying and he was uh, singing. Uh, here he's in chains, singing and everything. And, and um, the jailer understood enough to, to ask questions about how he could find redemption, how he could be saved. And of course, Paul tells him that uh, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the man and his family uh, are baptized. They become, they become believers. Um, afterwards, when they try to release Paul, of course, Paul at that point... Um, pulls out his trump card and says, you know, you can't do that. You can't beat up a Roman citizen the way you've beaten me up without a trial, with any, without any, any evidence, and uh, think you're going to get away with it. And of course, they, they went crazy because, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. um, for, any, for any regional, um, provincial type governor or, or ruler, to do that to a Roman citizen, uh, you're, now you can be brought up on charges. Now you can end up paying the price. So of course they came over and apologized and everything to, to Paul, which goes to show that Paul uh, is not the kind of person who doesn't know how to use his, you know, it's like, uh, you know, some Christians will say, oh, you know, that's not having to do with the world, you know, nothing is. Paul knew how to use his power and his position. Mm -hmm. He was a Roman citizen. And he says it, he was not a Roman citizen because it was bought, uh, as he tells, uh, mm -hmm. his, um, who's, who is it that he tells that to? I think it is the, 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 the person. Uh, in Philippi, and the, the guy in Philippi tells him how much he had to pay to to get his citizenship. And Paul says, "I was born a citizen." So they, you know, it was something, of course, that it, it was handed down from his father, and uh, and that was very common. That it, it was believed that in Tarsus, quite a number of Jews uh, had ha, had worked out, or had worked with the emperor and helped them out, and because of that, they, they became citizens. And uh, and this and Paul's uh, father must have been one of these individuals. And of course, it was transferred down to him. Um, and of course, Paul, as he says in, in Thessalonians, when he's writing to Thessalonians, which I was actually I was listening to Paul today, and uh, I went through a number mm -hmm. of letters. I, you know, Paul is just one of those, I, I can't help it. So I was listening to Paul, and, and I remember when I got to First Thessalonians, he says, we have previously uh, suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. So he, uh, he admits that uh, this was uh, a very bad experience for him there. But mm -hmm. of course... Uh, he took the upper hand there. Uh, any questions? No. In AD 51, Paul, in obedience to a vision, made the momentous decision of leaving the Middle Eastern uh, setting of Asia Minor. With Silas, Timothy, and Luke, he set sail for Europe. His first stop was the Roman colony of Philippi, a city of considerable importance in the ancient world. Meeting a, a group of faithful Jewish women, he proclaimed the Christian gospel, uh, found a receptive audience, and established his first Christian congregation in Europe. Um, the reason we know there was not a large body of, uh, of Jews there is because he went down to the river, where, whereas I guess where the Jews would gather for like a, a, mm -hmm. prayer, like a prayer group, a prayer meeting, and, uh, but they had no synagogue. Uh, in order to have a synagogue, you have to have at least 10 Jewish males. So that means we're, we're, in a, we're in Philippi, there are about 10,000 people, and there's not even 10 Jewish males. So uh, Judaism has not really put its claws into mm -hmm. Philippi, and it, it's a great opportunity for Paul. But we'll see that even though the, uh, even though the Ju uh, Judaism is not there, we will discover when we get to Philippians chapter 3 that these Jewish Christian missionaries who haunted Paul— <laughs> For so many years in Galatia, are are probably heading to Philippi, if they're not already there, when Paul writes a letter to the Philippians. Because obviously he's there in 49, 50 AD. Around 55 AD, he writes a letter to Philippi, to the Philippians. 
And by that time, it looks like these missionaries have already gotten there or they're on mm -hmm. their way there. And so Paul really uses extremely, extremely harsh language um, to deal with them and to and to mention what uh, what kind of people they are, even though apparently he had already instructed the Philippians about them before he left them. Any question? Uh, young Timothy appears to have played a significant role in this work, and a natural bond was created between him and the Philippians. Among the first believers who struggled along with Paul in his ministry were several women, Lydia, Yudia, Syntyche, which we're going to learn about, because Yudia and Syntyche, who are co-workers with Paul, uh, also seem to be having some sort of conflict with each other. And so one of the things that Paul does in this letter is to uh, get the Philippian, other, the other leaders in Philippi to work with these two women who are leaders and get them to reconcile, to move forward. Again, to me, uh, another important sign that just gets, I don't know, I don't know why people just cross over these. I don't know why they, they accuse Paul of having a certain view of women. And, it, and, and for example, how we dealt with First Timothy, where it says about women should not teach, women should be quiet. If that really was a universal thing, a universal issue, then here, in dealing with two women, he should have told them, hey, shut up. You guys are not allowed to talk. You guys are not allowed to do it. But he doesn't. And he calls them co-workers. They are co-missionaries with him in the work that they were doing. Uh, so he wants them to be reconciled as leaders in the church and, and to, to get back in, into harmony with each other. So again, if, if Paul had this idea that women should not have any role, do anything, Really, this is one of the one of the red flags that should come up with the fact that here he is uh, trying to soothe over the situation rather than just saying, hey, you know what, tell them to be quiet, tell them to sit down, tell them to talk to your husbands. I don't want to hear from them. But he doesn't do that. So again, another another sign of, uh, of the importance of women in the early church. Um, there's also another important figure named Clement, who might be the, the Clement of Rome, eventually who uh, becomes the bishop of Rome uh, in considered what is it uh, he's the one two the second pope after peter <laughs> uh, no, he, second pope was uh linus oh it was linus uh, so clement must yeah. be third clement is in there somewhere uh clement is uh third then and um and he's the bishop of rome and of course he wrote a letter he's actually well known because he wrote a letter two letters but one of them was actually to the corinthians mm -hmm. which, uh, if you if you've never read you know i guess a lot of christians don't read these i mean a lot of Christians don't read these writings, but it really is worth reading because you get a flair of what the early church was like. And certainly to, 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 to read Clemens' uh, letter to the Corinthians, you realize, wow, the Corinthians never grew up. <laughs> Even years after, you know, he's writing in 90 AD, you know, like some 50 years, some 40 years after Paul wrote yeah. to the Corinthians and dealt with the Corinthians. And they're still having similar problems to the fact of what they had 40 years earlier. So uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, Paul's experiences in the city of Philippi were, were not all pleasant. Uh, of course, they included the conflict and imprisonment. Even his jailer, of course, was converted which, uh, and joined the congregation. Having been asked by the authorities to go away, they didn't want any, any issues with Paul because of what happened. Paul left, most likely left uh, Luke in charge of the congregation and headed west toward uh, Thessalonica. During the three weeks of difficult ministry in the city, Paul several times received material assistance and thus spiritual encouragement from the uh, believers in Philippi. Um, Philippi became one of these churches uh, that Paul not only established, but he had no problem receiving gifts from them. Uh, uh -huh. They had a great love for Paul. And so Paul uh, accepted financial support from them. Even when he was doing the work in Corinth, when he's ministering into the Corinthians, he won't accept anything from the Corinthians, but he will from the Philippians. And uh, as I pointed out when we did our study of Corinthians, the reason is because he knew the Corinthians liked to have the idea of patron-client mentality. That the fact is that if I'm financially supporting you, I own you. You need to do what I want you to do. You need to go in the direction I want you to go. And Paul knew this about the Corinthians. He understood their mindset. And it was not like the mindset of the, of the Philippians. The Philippians had no such mindset. Despite the fact that they were supporting Paul, they never thought that they had an upmanship on Paul or that they owned Paul. On the contrary, they were just very, they felt very blessed that they could support the ministry and, and see the ministry prosper. But Paul never accepted money from the Corinthians, except 
uh, to help the Jerusalem believers. That there he he wanted every church to be involved in that, every Gentile church. But mm -hmm. he did, but he did not accept money from them because of their mindset towards uh, these things and how how they treated um, that idea of the leaders and who they thought they were because they were supporting people. And again. Um, just a very different way of thinking than the Philippines. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, forced to flee, flee, of course, when Paul left Philippi, he went to Berea, then to Athens, and then finally to Corinth, where he stayed for a full 18 months before returning to Antioch. And again, during his long time in, uh, in Corinth, as I mentioned, he was being supported uh, by the Philippians, at least, at least by them. I don't know if by the I think maybe Thessalonica also. Uh, when most commentaries have suggested the Philippians was written from Rome, with some favor, uh, favoring Caesarea, um, a number of scholars today are putting uh, uh, Paul, put Paul's writing of this letter in Ephesus when he when he was in Ephesus, uh, so somewhere in the mid fifties, um, and for several reasons. We know that Paul spent considerable time period of time in Ephesus. Not only that, but an Ephesian imprisonment is a sound deduction based on loose report of Paul's tumultuous time there. Um, Paul, for example, because when he, when he was in, uh, again, in Ephesus, because so many were converting or so many things were happening, people were afraid that um, Artemis, Diana, would not be mm -hmm. working correctly. And so, of course, it was a big, big riot thing. You know, uh, they all gathered in the, in the Colosseum. They were all chanting for hours. You know, great mm -hmm. Artemis uh, of, the, of the Ephesians. Ephesians. And, uh, it really, uh, pa Paul apparently was arrested. Paul went through a great deal of, of uh, a situation there. So much so that he said, he remarks about the troubles that he experienced in, in Asia. And he talks about having fought with wild beasts in Ephesus. And mm -hmm. we know that we know that it cannot mean literally wild beasts right. because there is no Colosseum. Um, no, no stadium, mm -hmm. no stadium where they had uh, those kind of fights and things going on. So he's actually metaphorically about what he endured. And this, of course, is, is most likely a metaphor for the imprisonment and the, and the things that he went through. Paul's travel plans cannot be squared with the composition of the captivity letters from Rome. We know from Romans that Paul was planning to travel to Spain after passing through Rome. Yet, when he writes to Philemon, remember he said, prepare for me a guest room, and Philemon is in Colossae, and, it is, and he's hoping to visit Colossae. So again, it's very impossible that it's Rome, because when he gets to Rome, he's not planning to go back. He's planning to go uh, head to Spain and take the gospel there. Uh, so if we locate these two letters in the Ephesian imprisonment, then, the, uh, then things make a little bit more sense. A trip to Colossae from Ephesus is easily manageable, uh, and so is the correspondence between Ephesus and Philippi. Uh, Timothy here is seen as the co-author of Philippians, yet we have no evidence that Timothy accompanied uh, Paul to Rome. On the contrary, the evidence that we have with Timothy is that eventually he settled down in Ephesus, where Paul writes to him the, the first and second Timothy. Uh, of course, like I mentioned before, the idea of the Praetorian uh, is not weird. Because some people look at the Praetorian and say, oh, my goodness, then he must be in Rome. But like I mentioned, uh, it's not weird to have uh, the, the force of Caesar in other places other than Rome. Any questions? No, the uh, yeah, they mentioned the same thing about the Praetorian, the palace, palace guard. Uh, and so they assume Rome. Yeah. Yeah. You said the uh, the the uh, mention of Caesar's household in 422 yeah. confirms that it's likely does not does refer to the Praetorian Guard stationed around Rome. And again, it it makes no sense. But when you read Philippians, just like Colossians, just like Ephesians, just like Philemon, Paul's mentality is not I'm heading to Spain. Paul's mentality is I'm going to Colossae. I'm heading back. I'll soon be released, and I'll be heading out to see you guys. He tells the Philippians, I'll soon be released, and I'm going to go see you guys. But yet, when you read Romans, where he is imprisoned, uh, when, he writes to, when he writes to the Corinthians uh, from Corinth, he writes to Rome. He says, I'm heading to Spain. 
this is his his mission goal mm -hmm. but again it's, it's hard to reconcile romans with these other letters because other letters actually show him going the, in, in the opposite direction and going back to a place where he was ministering and this is why a number of authors today a number of commentators take an ephesian uh prison imprisonment and and they'll say well when paul was in prison in ephesus this is when he wrote ephesians colossians philippians um mm -hmm. philemon and then shortly after being released he writes second corinthians which is uh, where you catch a lot of the pain of what he had to endure in Ephesus, where mm -hmm. again, it's not Rome, it's what he had to endure in Ephesus was so harsh that he was on the brink of like despair. He thought it's all over. And that's how he ends up writing Second Corinthians. Again, it's hard to reconcile these things. It's hard to put them together. And that's why I guess every, every uh, all these commentators are trying to guess how, how this is done. But obviously the book that you have in your hands, uh, like many others, We'll put it in Rome. Some put it in Caesarea, but more and more are putting it in Ephesus. So uh, maybe maybe in a few more years, we'll see a, a definitive shift in that direction. But I find more and more commentators going for the Ephesian uh, imprisonment. Any questions? Yeah. Um, on the situation reflected in the letter, the Philippians did not present Paul with problems. The church was relatively healthy compared to some other Paul's other other churches. The Philippians were not uh, were undisturbed by the anxieties and idleness, for example, that was going on in Thessalon Thessalonica, where you know you had all these people worried about the uh, the end is coming. What are we supposed to do? And you had Christians who said, "Oh, the end is coming, so why work?" And they were leeching off other believers. And you had immoral issues going on as well. Uh, you had Corinth, which was oh my goodness, Corinth is like just pure heathenism, so much immorality, so much factionalism. Uh, but the Philippians have none of that. Of course, they have some minor struggles going in, but nothing major. They, like other churches of Macedonia, had undergone persecution and hardship uh, and were experiencing the same struggles that Paul himself had known. And Paul's going to relate that to them, the fact that, that they are now suffering just like he suffered. Uh, and of course, they're, they're suffering from that. And they're also, this is why also, the temptation will be there to embrace Judaism, because hopefully, if, if if they can, if they, and this is why Paul has to warn them about the about these uh, the Judaism again, because if they embrace Judaism, then they'll be under the umbrella of the Jews, and the Jews, of course, were exempt from worshiping the emperor, they were exempt from worship uh, from doing sacrifices, um, and so they want they want to they don't want to be persecuted, they don't want to go through this. But Paul, of course, has to warn them. Uh, not to do this. Um, so again, Paul's concerned because it looks like these Jewish Christian missionaries, uh, similar to those who gave him trouble in Galatia, like I said, either have already arrived or they're on their way there. From what I can tell from Paul's letter so far, as I've been studying it, it doesn't look like they're there yet, but it looks like they're definitely heading in that direction. And Paul refers to them very, very harshly. For example, in chapter three, he says he refers to them as those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Incredible language. I mean, today you hear people saying, well, you know, we shouldn't speak harshly about other people. We shouldn't call you shouldn't call uh, cult leaders, cult leaders. You shouldn't speak bad about. You no, know, Paul had no problem. You know, Jesus had no problem. I remember mm -hmm. one, one person was trying to correct me about that on Facebook. And I said, you kidding me? Jesus called Jesus called the the Pharisees children of the devil. Your father's the devil. I mean, come on. I've never said anything like that to anybody. <laughs> you know. And here's Paul saying, "You're there. These people are evil doers. They're they're dogs. They're mutilators of the flesh." This is harsh language. Uh, and so again, to see people, you know, so sensitive today. Um, you know. But again, if you don't, if you don't really react to something that is definitively wrong then people will think that you're compliant that somehow you're okay with it so if there's something in our in our culture that is definitively wrong or some sort of group a christian some maybe a group that even calls itself christian or whatnot they are definitively wrong about something it is imperative of us as christians to call them out mm -hmm. no this is this is not right this is not the gospel you know, like you just just today, I you know the other day somebody posted something about about Easter and the bunny, 
And they were like, you know, they accused anybody who 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 had the bunny of uh, of worshiping Ishtar. And I'm like, really, seriously, you know, I, I've never known anybody, a Christian or non-Christian, that worships Ishtar. Most people don't even know who Ishtar is. I'm like, this is ludicrous. And they try to compare that to the five virgins that were ready and the five virgins that were foolish. And I was like, no, this is stupid. And I told them, I said, this, this, the five virgins and the ten virgins has nothing to do with Ishtar. So your analogy is, is com and completely wrong. So, you know, again, if we don't call people out, you know, uh, they're going to keep propagating these things. And so as Christians, we, there are times when we have to call people out and say, no, no, this is, this is wrong. Even though we may agree with certain groups about this or that, there are things that we have to say no. And if they're right, they're right. If they're, if a group comes out and we may not like certain things about them, but they make a statement which is true, we shouldn't say it's not true because that group said it. We have to say no, it's that's true. That that is a true thing. Even though you know, even though that person said it, and we know that person's uh, wrong about other things. He's right about mm -hmm. this. So again, Paul Paul doesn't have that problem. You know. Uh, again, these these individuals are are pronouncing the this uh, that Judaism is superior, that Gentiles need to be male Gentiles need to be circumcised, and again they're putting their confidence in the flesh. Uh, scholars again uh, are disagreed as to whether these people have arrived there or not. Uh, I'm I'm going to argue that they haven't yet gotten there, but they're almost there. Um, the letter includes personal information and exhortations. Uh, expresses Paul's own hopes to be released and to visit Philippi once more. But the principal occasion for the letter is Paul's gratitude for the financial support that he's received uh, from, from the Philippi Philippians. Any questions? No, no questions. I don't know if we should get started. Maybe I should I jump into... Now, maybe we'll, we'll stop there. I want to stop okay. there. Because so what... We have the background of Philippi. So we have <clears> the background of Philippi and Paul and why he wrote it and where he was and stuff like that. And those are the main things that we have. Next week, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll jump into Philippians itself. I don't want to jump into it because actually right at the beginning, I mean, right in verse one, he mentions overseers and deacons. And, and I want to deal more in detail with that, especially with the fact that many times you hear Christians, uh, uh, Christian scholars or people saying, you know, that. I think this this is developed in the 19th century. The idea that um, that the Christian Church was really very unorganized, very kind of like Corinth, you know, charismatic, speaking in tongues, and the idea of a full blown leadership and government within the church really is a late development, like First Testament, hmm. First and Second Timothy, and that they don't they don't even believe that First and Second Timothy are written by Paul. Uh, by somebody else, and that's a real late development. So the church, yeah, again, it's a, it's a mindset. It's almost a sociological mindset that all oh, the group must have started out as a charismatic group, and then as it grew, it became more organized and became like the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that's, <laughs> not, that's nonsense because right here in Philippians, we see Paul right off the bat saying, "Overseers and deacons, there is an organized leadership." Overseers is elders. Yeah. So they already have that, and we're talking around 55 AD. He's writing to them, and he established. Yeah, they, 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 they also have in the Book of Acts with uh, with the Stephen. He was a deacon. Exactly. You know, and all that but, was organized already. But again, but Luke's. Well, you mentioned Acts. They do. They do the same thing in the Book of Acts that Paul, that Luke wrote it. Maybe Luke didn't even write it. Somebody else wrote it years, years later, and so mm -hmm. they they read back into it an organization that wasn't there. But you can't do that with Paul. That's why I love doing the study of Paul because. You can't do that with Paul. Paul was there. This is part of it. Unless you try to uh, try to argue that some sort of interpolation or something like that. Which sometimes they do that too. They'll say this was actually put into the text, but then they have no textual evidence to prove that. Um, so here it is very early on, a very well-developed leadership. And so I, what I was going to say is that uh, Paul witnesses witnessed the, uh, the stoning of Stephen. Stephen. And uh, at that time, it was already an organized, uh, you know, church. Yes, because exactly. Stephen was among you. So even before Paul came into the picture, it exactly. was already an organized church. Which means this is what Paul's doing exactly. He's organizing the churches the way they had been organized from the, the way they started from the okay. beginning, overseers and deacons. So the apostles, you know, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, 
it was an organizational thing that kept, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, apostles would come in, there were prophets, and then of course they established a church where they would have the elders, you would have uh, deacons, uh, and that was it. And this is how they, this, this was a very common formation. But I think one of the mistakes people make is that we tend to think that if Paul doesn't mention it, it couldn't have been important. And we forget that Paul is writing letters that are occasional letters. There are letters that deal with issues within that church. For example, if you think about it, think about all the letters of Paul. Corinthians is the only letter, the only letter where he mentions the Lord's Supper. So are we, to, are we supposed to imagine that somehow the Lord's Supper was not important for Paul or that he never taught it? Of course not. But it, there was never an issue in any other church with the Lord's Supper. So he never had to bring it up. But of course, mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper was important to Paul. Uh, he, when he tells us about it in, in Corinthians, we see how vital it is to Paul. But yet he never mentions it anywhere else because he doesn't have to. Right. It wasn't a problem in Philippi. It wasn't a, poor, a problem in Galatia. It wasn't a problem in, in a you know, in, uh, in, for the Romans, but it was a problem for the Corinthians. I mean, so if we didn't, if, so we didn't have First Corinthians, we might think that the Lord's Supper was not important at all for Paul. And yet Paul makes mm -hmm. it very clear that it was being, it was done every, uh, every week when they gathered, they did the Lord's Supper. And this was common, a common tradition, common words, common ideas. Uh, but we would not know it unless we had First Corinthians. So again, it's, we have to be sure we don't read into a text something that's not there. And so when right. they and so when they don't when they don't see elders <laughs> and deacons being mentioned in First Corinthians, they assume oh it's a charismatic atmosphere and they don't have an organized church. Yes, they do. They have an organizational leadership, uh, but Paul doesn't have to address them the way he addresses them in other places. Here, he addresses them because they are vital. to The fact of dealing with an issue that's going on in the leadership between these two women, and so he addresses them to deal with this issue. Any questions? No. So you see, I already got into first the first verses, but we're yeah. Gonna, well, we're gonna, go deeper, preview. Preview. we're gonna go deeper into those verses because there's a lot there's a lot there, and, and it's gonna take us a, a while to okay to, to uh, hammer it out. But at least we have a, we have now an introduction to Philippians. Yeah. Any other questions? No, no, we got it. Facebook. God bless you. Good seeing you. Good night. Victor, always a pleasure.